I want to talk about the legal concept of the prima facie case, important part of legal procedure, both in criminal procedure and civil procedure. Prima facie is one of these old Latin terms uh, that has made its way into the law. It, at first glance, seems to mean something sort of superficial. Um, we use it sometimes to say based on first impression. Um, but in the law, it actually has a kind of depth and significance that goes kind of quite far beyond what we might call superficial. Um, so don't get too distracted by the idea that it refers to the first impression of something. So, for example, in this Cornell Law School uh, kind of resource, the dictionary, almost uh, encyclopedia in some sense, they note that prima facie is Latin for at first sight, but then they go on to offer a much more uh, sophisticated and rigorous explanation of what prima facie really means. And this is the way the law uses it. So sometimes we use it as an adjective that means, um, as I note here, sufficient to establish a fact or raise a presumption unless it's otherwise disproved or rebutted. So prima facie evidence, we use it that way or in an adverb sense, uh, something is prima facie valid, it means that um, at first appearance, it appears to be valid, but subject to further evidence or information. Um, but the most important way that we use it, and what I want to stress for, uh, for us for this class, is a prima facie case establishes the legally required rebuttable presumptions that it takes to get a conviction. So a prima facie case is actually a strong case. It means that admissible evidence exists sufficient to establish the elements of the uh, the law, the crime, or the, the civil wrong that is at issue in the case. So, um, kind of stressing that again, a prima facie case establishes a legally required rebuttable presumption. A prima facie case is uh, the cause of action that is sufficiently established by the party's evidence to justify a verdict in his or her favor unless the evidence is rebutted by the other party. That's what we mean by a rebuttable presumption. So rebutting the evidence can mean um, rebutting one particular element of the evidence, or it can in some cases, and very often does mean, agreeing that all of the evidence the plaintiff presents is there, but that there is some defense. Um, some, some other reason why, despite those um, evidentiary findings, the defendant might still be considered not guilty. So for example, every tort, um, every crime, every tort has elements. And this is what we mean when we say someone is thinking like a lawyer. Well, one part of that is reasoning by analogy, using precedent, um, not just kind of knee jerk or off the top of your head, but it also means exploring and examining the precise elements that are required in defining a legal wrong or a crime. So the tort of trespass has these three prima facie elements or prima facie components. The defendant had the intent to invade the land. The defendant did invade the land and the plaintiff owned the land and did not consent to the invasion by the defendant. Um, so when you say someone trespassed, what you're saying in court is you have to have admissible evidence to prove these three things. And if you do prove these three things, then you've created a rebuttable presumption of the defendant's guilt or liability. And it's up to the defendant to find some way to rebut this evidence or come up with a defense that says, well, despite the fact that evidence suggests I did these three things, there was a reason, like maybe necessity. I had, there was an emergency of some kind, but um, the defendant is now on the spot. They can't, in some sense, remain silent. They have to find some way to address this evidence. So in the Legal Information Institute's uh, in material, they have a list of many of the basic torts, for example, and what the elements are to make out the prima facie case for each of those torts. So common law battery, for example, which is what we are talking about when we're talking about someone hitting someone else. Um, we have to have evidence of these five things, um, that the defendant did some act, 
that the defendant in intended to cause contact with the plaintiff um, through their touch, um, that the defendant uh, did touch and cause harm or offense. Um, so there's some objective test. Is this a harmful or offensive touching? Um, that the defendant's touch was the cause of the plaintiff's harm and not something else. Um, so there can be like a chain of events where the defendant, you know, throws a ball and it breaks a window and the glass shatters and the glass, you know, hits the plaintiff in the eye and does serious damage. Well, is that battery? Um, you would say, well, the, the defendant didn't hit them and the ball didn't hit them, but the glass hit them. Well, the glass then um, causes contact. So we'd have to explore, is this an example of what we call battery or is it something else? And then finally, this sort of fifth element is that there are no defenses. So defenses would be, well, the plaintiff consented. Um, you know, uh, uh, someone punching someone in the face is normally considered battery. But if you're a sparring partner or you're in a, an MMA match, then you consented to be punched, right? That's part of the activity. So um, a defense of consent is always a good defense, uh, not, um, not something to be taken lightly. But also other areas where maybe the defendant acted out of necessity. The plaintiff didn't consent to the trespass, for example, but it was an emergency situation and the defendant needed to kind of cross the property or take refuge in the property. And so we would say, well, that's an excuse. And uh, the person is, is therefore not going to be held for uh, a wrong. A prima facie case then means that the plaintiff has produced sufficient admissible evidence that there's a reasonable conclusion in favor of the allegations. Um, it essentially means the plaintiff was going to win the case unless the defendant produces some evidence to rebut the plaintiff's evidence. Um, here from this Pennsylvania court case, it says the plaintiff's evidence not only compels the defendant to produce evidence on the issue in question, but it also shifts the burden uh, to the defendant on this issue. In other words, the defendant's, uh, the plaintiff's evidence establishes a presumption in favor of the contention on the issue and shifts the risk um, to the defendant. So the, def the burden of persuasion is shifted to the defendant. Um, and that means a prima facie case is a pretty substantial case. It's not a trivial thing. It means, for example, the defendant is going to lose unless they come up with some admissible evidence on their side of the story. Um, so that makes prima facie case pretty important. Um, and it, it fits in with the idea that you think like a lawyer by exploring the elements of the case. What are the elements that are required to prove a certain case or a certain claim? We'll be talking about this a lot more as the term goes by, but I thought this would be a good introduction.